am recording. So this is the San Francisco Drupal Users Group for those of you that don't know, but um, we're global. And I just wanna like do some ground rules. Um, we have certain expectations here because um, it is being recorded for longevity. So we ask that people remain muted um, during the main presentation, um, unless Mike wants to have an open Q&A, it's kind of up to him. Um, but if there's any like background noise happening, just mute yourself. And then when you're unmuted, be mindful of that background noise um, and be mindful of the background noise in relation to the code of conduct too. Um, and then the virtual backgrounds are okay, but let's not use the moving ones because um, some people that are part of our group um, suffer from both um, motion induced sickness, vision motion induced sickness. So let's leave those virtual backgrounds off and then um, be nice and be respectful. And that leads us to our code of conduct, which is the Drupal code of conduct and the Bad Camp code of conduct. And we want to make sure that everyone is safe and friendly and cooperative and we have productive dialogue. And this applies to the chat um, as well as um, uh, vocal communication. And we're here with Mike Herschel today with uh, Front End Roulette, where we get to choose our own Drupal adventure and we can have lots of fun with this. Um, and the Drupal news um, for the last two weeks. Uh, Lullabot came out with an article about the Oliveira theme. It released its first alpha. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Oliveira theme is going to um, replace Bartik in Drupal, um, starting with hopefully version 9.1 as the new default theme. And I'm sure um, Herschel can tell us more about that. And what's new on Drupal.org? Um, Drupal 9 is still set to be released on June 3rd. Um, it's Drupal 9 beta is available now. And the Drupal Association is encouraging us to participate and um, beta test it um, because, you know, us using the software uh, helps them figure out how we're using the product and find bugs. Um, and there is also a new release of new evergreen branding, and that's in the corner of the slide. So now um, we can use that for all versions of Drupal. You know, you know, some of them have the Drupal 9 and, or the Drupal 8 and the Drupal 7s in there. So this is the evergreen version. Um, Drupal Spoons. Um, Moy Schweitzman um, announced a program through Get Lab for... Um, it's, it's trying out a new process for collaboration in the issue queue is what it is. Um, it's a particular configuration of groups. Um, it offers issues and merge requests very much like pull requests and um, also uh, has some continuous integration um, aspects to it. The Devel project was migrated over there if you want to use that for an example. And they're encouraging people to kind of migrate their projects over there and see how that workflow goes. Um, because, you know, we're trying to move away from um, patches and do more modern um, collaboration. And the Drupal Spoons project is sort of that, that uh, example project. Um, the community working group today came out with a blog article with, with which had some resources for those of us who might have been impacted by COVID-19 or in general with losing, losing work. Um, so that was an interesting article. And then make sure you check out Drupal Planet for articles on web accessibility. Lullabot, Canopy, Evolving Web, Promet Source, and some others um, all published articles around Global Accessibility Awareness Day. There's a lot of great tutorials for beginners on how to begin testing what WCAG is, what accessibility is. So that's worth checking out the last two weeks of Drupal Planet. And Drupal events. Um, Drupal Camp Asheville went online and they are July 10th through 12th. They will have um, an unconference day and a day of sessions and trainings. Um, we all know that DrupalCon has went global, and that's July 14th through 17th, and they're still working on the programming for that. Drupal Camp Colorado, I believe, went virtual, and there'll be August 14th through 16th. Drupal Camp Atlanta is accepting call for papers. They'll be September 10th through 12th. Bad Camp, of course, everyone's favorite camp, is virtual and global, so please come to Bad Camp. That's October 14th through 17th. 
And Drupal Camp New York City is coming back after a hiatus of a couple years and their dates are to be announced. They're either gonna be the last weekend in October or the second weekend in November. And Drupal Jobs. Um, we can like talk about this after Mike does his presentation, but we'll ask who's hiring and who's looking. You can always go to um, jobs.drupal.org and see the list of the jobs that are published there. And next at SF Doug, we have quite the lineup. Um, our friend Mercutio is going to talk about Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 migrations by example. Um, it's a shorter version of the training that he gives at Bad Camp. Um, June 25th, um, Jeff from Tandem is going to talk about Lando and Drupal contributions and how to set up your Lando environment specifically for giving back to Drupal. And then um, Bay Area native Gabe is going to talk about LLC corporations and sole proprietorships and partnerships. And then our very own Alyssa, who I saw in the crowd, is coming to us July 9th with um, some information about the voting API and talking about a case study that she did with Oomph. And, you know, I love everybody and I want everyone to present. So if you have an idea, just reach out to me um, and let me know and we can get you either talking at SF Doug or at Bad Camp. And then talking about Bad Camp, we are looking for volunteers because we have gone virtual, which means we will need more volunteers than an actual in-person um, event. So if you're interested in either being a part of the organization team, which can include um, talking about logistics for content delivery, um, being room monitors, um, doing session selection. There's a whole bunch of um, things that you can do to help volunteer at Bad Camp. And then we wanna thank Canopy Studios because um, you know, they organized and they're providing the Zoom room for tonight. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and let my Herschel take over. Take it away, Mike. Thanks, Amy Jean. Hey, everybody. Um, so, my name is Mike Herschel. I am a senior front end developer at Lullabot. I do a lot of things, and um, this particular day, I didn't know what I was going to present on, so I said I could present on one of these things. And then if not, uh, if no one's even interested in those, you could just pick a topic and maybe I can uh, just kind of BS my way through it. But um, so, yeah, so I live in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I've been at Lullabot for about six years. Um, and I co-organize Florida Drupal Camp with Mike Canelo, who's recently stepped down. And a couple other people are stepping into his shoes. And yeah, um, so my, the topics, right? So I, I, I think we're just going to have people. How do you want to do this, Amy Jane? Do you want people? I have like an online poll that people can vote on, or we can just like say hey, or people can raise. I don't know if people can raise their hands or what. Um, can people raise their hands? I don't know. I am not a Zoom expert. Neither am I. Um, there are reactions of clapping. Um, Let me put this little vote thing in the uh, in the chat right here, and then um, we'll see if this works. I set this up just uh, on vote. And uh, I set that up just maybe like half an hour ago. And let me click on the results and see. All right, yeah, so, all right. So I can see the results right here. So the options that we have are, um, I can talk about the new uh, Drupal Olivero theme, which is gonna be a new theme that's gonna replace Bartik. So this is gonna replace like the whole look and feel of the whole front end of Drupal, at least by default. And it's really cool, it's coming along really well. There's a lot of stuff to do, a lot of cool stories and things like that. Um, I could talk about web website performance and uh, I, I have a couple like really, or I have a really good presentation on web performance. I talk about how to make your website super fast, talk about what that even means, 
talk about JavaScript performance, uh, font performance, style sheet performance, rendering, a lot of, a lot of really cool things. Uh, Browser-based developer tools are, um, this is a presentation I used to give uh, a while ago, and I just kind of run through Chrome developer tools, and there's a little bit of Firefox in there, and I just, I just kind of go through the tabs and go through options, and there's a bunch of little keyboard shortcuts and little things that um, I guarantee you're going to find uh, some cool stuff in there. Um, CSS selectors 101 through something. This is a presentation I gave for my front end meetup. And I thought it was going to be such a basic presentation. And then at the end of it, I had like a hundred slides. It was like ridiculous. CSS selectors are way more complicated than I, even I realized. And so I have a presentation on that. So I have another presentation called X debug your twig templates. And this is not even a presentation. It's more just of a how to. And basically, if you are a front end developer that does Drupal and you're not using X debug in your twig templates, you're kind of missing out on just some like really, really easy, easy things. And uh, I feel like my, my back end level of experience kind of went from like, maybe like level two to level six, or maybe not level six, maybe like level four, <laughs> when I did X debug, so it doubled, you know, X, X debug is like really awesome. And then I have stories from my childhood. And, and this is not, nothing Drupal related. This is just me blabbering about random stuff. And I just put that in for a joke. And I'm going to share my screen right now so you can kind of see what's happening here. So X debugging the Twig templates is currently winning. And you are allowed to game the system by opening up the uh, link in, uh, in incognito or private windows if you so desire. <laughs> so we'll see what wins. Whoever is doing X debug your twig templates, which might be Mike Anello, is uh, currently winning. That one's only uh, about 15, 20 minutes, though. So I can do something else after that if we need to. <laughs> the stories from my childhood, by the way, I have two votes in there for me when I was just testing out this polling thing. So I only had just 22 votes, so you could take out a couple there. I voted for that one. Yeah, I don't have that. My stories are pretty boring, but I can tell you about, I grew up on a pig farm. Uh, and what else did I do? High school was interesting. And you rode the pigs. Yeah, I rode the pigs, right, really. Like I used to grab the pigs when I was a little boy and grab their ears and ride them around the pens. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Millie. All right, so at this point, I'm going to do X debug your twig templates. And this is more of a how-to right here. And, um, and then from there, I can uh, talk about maybe CSS selectors. People don't really seem to be too interested in aloe vera or web performance. So uh, well, we can skip those. And then I can uh, intersperse uh, things about my childhood in there. So... Um, who here uses Xdebug or might even know what Xdebug is? Anybody? I got a couple of people. Does anybody use those in Twig templates? Yeah, I see. I see. Was it Danny? Right, Danny. I've 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 interacted with you on Drupal.org before, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's the best ever, and so hopefully this is going to uh, this is going to redo your workflow. So. If you don't know what Xdebug is, it's basically a debugger for PHP. And when I say debugger, what I'm talking about is it, it allows you to actually like put something in, in your window or, or like in the code or, or stop the code at a particular point in time. And then you can see what all the variables are and you can maybe like run test code to see if something evaluates one way or the other. And it just makes everything like super interesting. Has anyone here when they're doing Drupal stuff have used things like Kent or DPM or anything like that? Yeah, that and, and, and you know what the worst thing about that is, is you have to like refresh the page and then, you know, you don't have any caching enabled and it takes like 30 seconds to reload and it gets like really, really frustrating. So Xbug uh, gets, around, gets around that. So I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to show you how I do it. 
So the, the most difficult thing about Xdebug is just um, getting it installed and enabled. Now I'm going to show you how I do it because I use MAMP and it's really, really easy. But if you're using things like Lando or DDEV or anything else, any type of PHP environment, there's ways to get Xdebug working. All you have to do is just Google it and then maybe like budget a couple hours because sometimes if you're doing it manually, it can be like a real pain in the butt, but it's totally worth it. So you should do it. So I use MAMP Pro, which is kind of a little bit old school, but I, I know it and it works really well. And it's just really easy. There's a checkbox right here that says X debug when I go to the little PHP right here. So I do X debug and it kind of works. Now I have a local copy of lullabot.com running right here. And so we're going to go into a template and, uh, and, and, and use Xdebug on that. And I'm going to kind of show you maybe how to traverse some type of entity type relationships and things like that. So um, I use PHP Storm when I do Xdebug type stuff. And um, you can install all types of Xdebug extensions and things like BS Code or Sublime Text or anything like that but I use PHP Storm because it's easy. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So, um, all right, so at this point, what I'm going to assume, and, and, and like I said, you can kind of apply this to whatever, but I'm gonna assume that you have Xdebug installed properly, and then I'm going to assume that, you know, you have your IDE, which in my case is PHP Storm uh, configured, to uh, use Xdebug, and if you don't know how to do it, there's like Drupal documentation pages, there's all types of Google types, things that you can Google on how to do that, right? So um, at that point, the next thing you need to do is install the Devel module. So let me, uh, if you're not familiar with Devel, it's drupal.org slash project project slash devel. And this is just basically a, a handy dandy module that enables a bunch of like really cool things. So you just install the devel module and enable it. And the reason that, that we need that is because we're going to use a function within that to, to debug the twig templates. And at that point, make sure Xdebug is turned on. And so from here, um, within Drupal, I'm going to go into my um, let's see, it's under my settings, that default, I believe, sites. Do I got a settings that default in here? Settings that local. So in my settings that local, I have to make sure I'm using like either development.services.yaml or in this particular, like, so Drupal core includes this development.services.yaml. And in order to um, debug stuff properly, you have to put in this like twig config stuff in here. You have to put in debug true, auto reload true, and cache false. And the thing about this is like, there's, there's template debugging where it outputs those HT, like HTML um, uh, comments indicating like what template you're using. And to do that, you have to have this debug true on, but you also need this debug true on in order for PH, for um, Xdebug to work. What I typically do is I move this into a custom.services.yaml file or custom-development.services. And the reason I do that is because every time you update Drupal, Drupal core, this development.services.yaml gets overwritten. So you, what I like to do is create this file called custom.services.yaml and I can, I can, you can find this and I can paste it somewhere uh, where you can find that. And at that point you go into your settings.php or in this particular case I have a settings.local.php and there's this setting in here that you can modify for this. And it says like, you know, container YAMLs is this file that I just created. And then I'm also gonna, um, I'm gonna uncomment these lines right here, which is gonna basically say like any type of caching just goes to nothing, so there's no caching enabled. So I'll, 
I will post somewhere all this code because I know this is this is almost impossible to remember, but at, basically at the gist of it is like you just have to copy and paste your code into Drupal and into the settings in your local environment and hopefully at that point it'll work. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to go into my command line and I'm going to, um, I'm going to clear the cache here. And um, now when I reload, I, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, there is this listen, or this little telephone button up, up to the top up here. I think this is it, right? Yeah. And it, so if I hover my mouse up here, I don't know if you can see as it says, start listening for PHP debug connections. So I'm just going to hit that. And there's different ways to do that. And now I'm going to go into the template that I want to debug here. So in this particular case, our theme, our front end theme is called Lullabot.com. I did not name it. I would have named it something more creative. And I think I have like some cool things in here that I can, I can talk about here. So let's go into um, content and the... Uh, the episode right here. So I'm in a template right now for the uh, like the uh, like the podcast episodes right here, right? And let's say like I want to go ahead and see the content variable, and I want to maybe play around with it live. I want to see what the attributes are. I there's a you know you can do the whole Kint thing where you output you output via Kint. You can do a dump or something like that. But in this particular case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do devel um, underscore breakpoint. And um, with some parens afterwards, and what that's going to do is that that will call a function within the develop module, and it will set a breakpoint when I reload the page. Now, uh, once again, a couple things have to be set in order for this to work. I have to have the develop module enabled. I have to have um, I have to have the uh, my uh, services YAML file set to to do all this type of stuff, including this debug true. I need to be. I need to make sure this services.yaml file is actually being used, and 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 that's within the settings that local, and then it also helps if your cache is um, your cache is disabled, so you don't have to clear cache on every time. So when I go to the website here, see this is dev. Uh, when I go to like a podcast episode, it should go ahead and straight up uh, give me a breakpoint. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So I'm going to click on this one right here. And this thing hopefully will just keep on spinning. And when it does, I'm going to go back to PHP Storm. Yeah. And so it gives you like this little panel popped up right here. And I can go to the debugger down here. And I'm going to show you all the cool stuff in here. So basically what I can do right here is I can start to explore. So everything that I have, um, everything that I have access to within the template is under this dollar context variable, a disarray right here. Michael, can you make it a little bigger? I don't know, maybe I can. Um, oh, I know what I have. I have a little... Uh, plus. Yeah, if I command plus, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't do nothing, but I, I, I know I can do it, so hold on one second. Uh, I can make that bigger. Isn't there like a presentation mode for this? I'm on my other monitor right now and say enter, is there a presentation mode or view? Yeah, yeah it's, it's under, there's a PHP storm presentation mode in the menu somewhere. Yeah. Is it at the upper right hand corner the, next to the, the uh, search icon? There's a... This? Run anything double. That was wrong. Yeah. So I'm looking at the, uh, am I... So. I think it's in the menu somewhere, like maybe under view or something. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I don't see it under view. You know, I'm going to Google it because that's, all right. So on my other screen, I'm going PHP Storm Pre... There's where the real adventure starts. Yeah. It's view appearance. 
view appearance. Oh man, you're way better than me. All right, so view appearance. Oh yeah, right there, presentation mode. Whoa, all right, yeah, but now you can't see the other. Can you see the debug thing or no? No. No, I'll see at the code window, so that's not very helpful. Yeah, that's useless. That's all I see, too. Maybe I can sw now, How do I exit out of this thing? I'm hitting escape. <laughs> I'm trapped. Probably go back up to the go back up to the same menu. No, because my whole other monitor like blacked out now. Oh, you got to reboot. You got to yeah, right. I'm gonna hit Command Q. All right. Oh, so that didn't work. Um, you know what I can do? I'm relaunching PHP Storm right now, and maybe I can go into my display preferences. It, oh, darn it, it's still in, still in it. How do, oh wait, no, here, here, here we go. Where was that, review? I don't think you're still in it. I just think all of the sidebars and stuff closed. So if you hit like project in the upper left, you're not in presentation mode. Oh, no, yeah. You're about to you are. Yeah. Okay. Well. Let's try one more time. This is this is how I normally code. Just like googling things and trying to find out. How did I bring up that menu before? There you go. All right. Now I'm at a full screen. All right, so let me go into my system preferences and see if I can adjust the, uh, maybe I can adjust the display that scaled. Well, it's allowing me for my, oh yeah, here we go, scaled. Is that, Maybe that's better. Is that any better or no? Can anyone hear me? I think it's better. Yeah, the, the text. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to reload the page. Yeah. Sorry about these technical difficulties right here. All right, so we're broken here. And so now I have the debugger up. This looks larger, right? Yeah, that seems a bit larger, yeah. Yes, good. Okay, so once again, to get here, I hit this like little telephone icon up here that says uh, start, instead start listening for PHP debug connection. Now it says stop. And then I reloaded the page. Now, everything that you have access to in Twig is under this dollar context array. So you can do thing, you can look at things like, you know, DB is active or is admin or logged in. So, you know, like, you know, within Twig now, I can do like if logged in. And at that point, if this evaluates to true, and I know it will, it could go there. I can check for view modes. I can check for if this is a teaser. I can look at the URL. I can see that everything is in here, right? And you can see the content array right here. Now the content array is basically everything that shows up under the display tab within your, um, within your content type. Um, this is everything that shows up right there. So you can see like, I, all right, so I have, co I have access to content dot field episode number content dot field episode explicit because we actually mark some of our episodes as explicit um, and body and things like that. Um, and then you also have on particular on, on nodes, you have access to a node object right here. And this is where things kind of get interesting because from here you can traverse uh, over to different entities. I'm going to show you a little bit on how to do that. And it's really easy. 
So let me give you a particular use case, and we're going to figure this out right here. So let me get back into, um, I'm just going to hit the, uh, hit the play button here to, to reload, to bypass that. You can also start stepping through stuff, but that's not as uh, valuable in Twig. But um, let me show you this particular uh, use case that we have here. Yeah, Mike, can I ask a question real quick? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it looks like you're stepping through, you're not really stepping through the Twig code. Is that right? Yeah, you this? are not stepping. You are not stepping through the Twig code. What you need to do is, if you want to do that, you have to literally copy and paste that X debug break into multiple places. Right. Uh, supposedly, newer versions of PHP Storm can do Twig debugging, but I wasn't able to configure it to work natively, so I always just use the um, this X debug break. This is great because this just seems like. You know, this is you know ninety percent of times this is this would be what I need. I just need to know what variables are available to me at a certain point. Absolutely, and so I'm going to show uh, a couple cool things right here. So uh, the particular use case that I have right here is the, so this is an episode node right here. So this is a podcast, and attached to this episode node we have a field that's a media field. So this is a media field that has an MP3 and that's attached through like an entity reference. I can actually maybe just show you what this looks like here. And I have to get rid of this like little menu thing. There we go. So this is going to take a long time to load since, you know, I'm on zoom and then also I don't have any cache and anything like that. So um, I have, Oh, I'm in the wrong content type. Um, so I have that, and then I also have this field right here for this image field that's that's off. This image field is actually attached to a show node, which is a um, uh, an entity reference. So, like, so so. Let, let me explain that a little bit better. So like I want to, on this particular page in this template, I want to get an image field off of uh, a, uh, a node that is referenced from, from a field on this node. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to show you how to use, uh, use, uh, X debug to kind of help you out with stuff like that, right? So um, in this particular case, like like if you wanna if you wanna look at the fields right here, like we have this field that got entity uh, a entity reference field, and that's where we're gonna get the image off of. And then there's a media field that's an entity reference that is uh, yeah asset field audio media right here. So I want to get I want to get the path to the MP3, and I want to get I want to get the field uh, for the uh, 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 for that image. So let's get back right here, and I'm going to reload this one more time, and then we're going to use uh, Xdebug, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So here we are. So um, we're going to do this by kind of going down through the node node object right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to go to evaluate expression. And so I can just type in like anything up here. Let me move something around here. I can type in like things like true. I know these are strings equals true and it will evaluate that, you know, or true equals that any you can type in anything up here and it will evaluate that and what's really cool is it evaluates that within the context of where it is you know so i can say is you know is logged in equal true or something you know so anyway so i'm going to go to context node right here and i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna i can see my fields in here 
And so I see like there's fields for like, you know, um, let's say we want to get this, um, th this URL for the, for the MP3 first, right? So I can take a quick look in here and hopefully I'll see it. But what, oh, my phone is buzzing. I don't know who that is, but I'm not answering it. There's this, um, what is it, get fields? Yeah. There's this method right here where you do a single arrow. Th I, I am not a PHP person, but you do single arrow, you do get fields, right? And it will show you like everything in here. And so you, you have to, this is one of the things you, you have to memorize right here. You do the get fields and then you see all the fields. And so like I know a particular, in this particular case, I, have, I need field audio media. Now you can do, the easiest thing to do is do, you can you can do field audio media and like that it's like a little drupal magic shortcut and it will give you everything now if, now this is an entity reference right here and i can look in here and i i don't see anything that gives me i see like this right here it's an entity reference i don't see anything that has the path of the mp3 or anything like that you know i don't know so after this what i'm going to do is i'm going to type an entity i'm going to do another arrow i'm going to say entity so now i have I, I do this entity and it shows me all right it shows me a bunch of other things and off of this i can do get fields and it shows me all of the fields that are off of the re resulting entity, so or the the reference entity. So in this particular case, I can see, all right, well, what what field do I want? And I look at the bottom right here, and I see there's this field media audio file, right? So all right, so field media audio file. I can do this, right? And all right, so maybe here I will find my my path you know I'm, I'm looking for the path to the um, to the mp3 and I, I don't see it here because this is another entity reference there's this the media field has a another entity reference to a file field why because it's Drupal because that's what Drupal does so we do another entity right so at this point we do get fields once again. And now we see like, well, what's under here, right? You see file ID list and I don't know, values. You see this, what are we gonna look for? You see URI, this might look promising. Ah, look at that right there. It's a, it's a public path to this. Now what you can typically do right here, so we do, so we, we know we want URI, so we will URI, and now we, now we have access just to this. And uh, under, under these values, you can typically just type in value. There's another like little shortcut right here. So I can do value, right? So I have all this stuff right here. I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to throw this into my twig. And obviously, it's not going to work because this is – this is PHP style, but I'm going to, it's pretty easy to convert that. So I'm going to uh, close this. I'm going to copy it, close, and I'm going to go back into my PHP file. How do I bring that up? Project. Where was under, it was under content. And I think it was the uh, episode node, no dash dash episode dash full right here we are. And let's say like, just so we can find, I'm going to throw it under an H1 tag, right? And so this is all the stuff I have right here. Obviously, this isn't valid twig, but the thing, the way that twig works is that you just basically replace everything with periods. And the context is already a given right here. So we're going to copy and paste all this stuff. And we're going to take out node and we're going to do a period this field audio media we're going to put a period in here uh, this the all these arrows we're going to basically put in periods 
here. And also, just so it's not covered in the, um, and actually, hold on, even better. Forgot that period between the period and right now. The period you are on. Where's the period? Where did I forget a period? Uh, you are I top value. Where I am value. Yeah. yeah. Does that look good? So now I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit the play button right here. I'm gonna turn and, and now it's it's not gonna show me this the stuff this time, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the listening so it doesn't break anymore. And now when I reload this, hopefully we will see what the data and then we can work we can work with it there and let's see what we have. It might just it just crash. Let's see. All right. Well, we see it right here. Well, the data is there. It's just not showing. In the, oh yeah, look at it. It's, you can actually kind of see it moving around here. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it showing up? I don't know. Anyway, but it's coming in here. We probably need to move it around so we have it. Um, I, I think I know why it's doing that. We need to throw it down underneath the header. <laughs> anyway. Uh, hopefully, yeah, right here. So you can see that the pat, right, this is the data that we want, but of course, we, this says public right there. So we don't want that public uh, to show up. Um, maybe I should remove this marquee stuff. And um, Drupal 8 twig functions. So you Google functions in Drupal 8 twig and you realize there's one called file URL and this should work right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna wrap this in file URL right here. And hopefully this will give me the exact file to the MP or the exact path to the MP3 right here. Right there it is. So that's the path to the MP3. And so now you can plug that in wherever you want. And I think I do something similar um, somewhere down here in the media. Well, maybe not. I think I have a different template for the media player. Um, a couple of things to note. This does not respect any type of caching or anything like that. Like, so Drupal has a, a very robust caching system where like, if you, like Drupal will know what you have in your contents array. So if you have anything in like, you, you know, what's in your managed display tab, Drupal knows that and it will invalidate the cache if something like that changes. This bypasses all this. This just goes like straight to the source, bypasses it. So it kind of breaks caching for this particular, it doesn't break caching. It, it doesn't, it, it just won't like clear any type of cache or anything like that. Uh, like if, if, if that data changes, uh, this, this page, this, this right here will not update properly uh, when, you, when you might expect it to. Um, so that's the gist of it right there. If you were to look at the image, um, I can show you kind of the same thing, uh, just to kind of, you know, uh, put the process in right there. If, if we were looking, if we were going to look through the image and maybe you can try to play around right here. The first thing I would do is I would go, if I want to just get that, I can go into, um, back into evaluate expression I can go and let's say I want to I want uh, I do get fields 
And I know get fields is, I, I know this image is based off of my uh, field parent. So I just do field underscore parent. And I know this is an entity, so I do entity. And then I do another get field or get fields. And now I look for the fields that I want and I see like there's a, uh, no, no, like what field do I want? I want the image field. Field show media. No, that's the, that's not what I want, I don't think. Background color, it might be the field show media. So field show media. And then, you know, you can look down here. Do you see a, uh, I see a target ID. So this is also an entity. And I see in here, there's a file media Im field media image. Expand this and I see the file right here. So I see, I, I, I see the, I want, I'm looking for the URL or let's do get field. Is there a field on this? I don't think there is. No, I think that is a field. See the path name. I'm looking for the URI. See the title, target ID, parent. I don't think the URI will work. Yeah. Um, I honestly have to look to see what I did here. I honestly don't know off the top of my head. But you kind of get the idea of like how to traverse this. You copy and paste this, replace all the arrows with dots. Um, there's a lot of better ways to do this type of stuff too if you're traversing entities. There's, there's, um, there's modules out there that like help you do this. Uh, twig field value is one of them. And basically you can, it, it puts filters up there. So you can do like content, dot field name dot field value and things like that that's useful um and then if you're not familiar with twig tweak twig tweak is another uh super good module uh that does a lot of things like that there's a cheat sheet for it that they highlight right there and the cheat sheet just shows you how to do a lot of cool things like that um but the gist of it is just being able to use Xdebug in your templates. And if you do that, uh, if you have Xdebug set up, you also can obviously use it in your pre-process file, which is, which is a more typical use case. And uh, yeah, any questions or anything else? Uh, I might or may not be able to answer some of these. Mike, I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, and it, this was amazing. It, it kind of opened my eyes to some things that I have not been doing in Twig, debugging in, within Twig. Um, so is there a difference between Devel Breakpoint and, for example, I, I usually, I've been using the Twig X debug module, and then I just go Breakpoint, or is it really, it looks like it creates this, it gets the same results. I think it's the same thing. Um... I honestly have never used the Twig X debug break because I mean, you typically have Devel installed if you're doing development, you know, because it has a lot of other handy dandy features. <laughs> so that's why I typically use Devel breakpoint and tell people about it. Um, I don't, I would be very surprised if there were any other, like if you look at this code right here, if function exists, break. I'm pretty sure the other one does the same. Mm. I'd be surprised if it didn't. And the, the other question was, I was listening to Talking Drupal podcast, mm -hmm. catching up on those the other day, and they, they said that in, oh, it was an episode about Twig, and they were mm -hmm. saying that if you're reaching that far down in a render array in Twig, 
well, you had mentioned the caching uh, breaking possibly. Yeah. But, but they also talked about uh, translations being an issue as well when you're doing that. Yeah, I can imagine that would be. Uh, to tell you the truth, that's a little bit outside of my expertise. Um, I would imagine that would. I would totally Im- like Drupal hand like as soon as you get like into the render arrays, Drupal handles like a lot of stuff like very magically. Um, a lot of stuff like this is useful if you're checking um, I don't know booleans or things like that. But I mean, there are certain cases where I've kind of cheated my way over into traversing entities and stuff. I I, I definitely don't want to call it best practice, but it's something that sometimes you just do. Um, I want to point out Bernardo's question in the chat. Oh, I don't have the chat open. Go ahead. Uh, When should one bother to do a pre-process function for the variables versus adding a long variable path inside Twig? What do you think? Yeah. What is your approach on that? That's a really good question. Uh, like, a lot of people try to keep their Twig templates like really, really clean and mark up, and I, I kind of like that approach. Um, it really depends on, on, like, the ultimate goal is to keep your code maintainable, and really, what that comes down to is who's going to be maintaining the code, and so is is the person that is hopefully down, you know, going to be looking at this after you are, do you know if they're, are, are they familiar with pre-processing and know how to find the correct hooks or are they familiar with tw- a little bit more familiar with twig? I, I can tell you like stuff like this is kind of it. If they don't know, um, if they don't know, if they don't have extra bug and stuff like that, it could be like a little difficult. But um, the thing is, you kind of need X debug and and pre-process anyway. So so maybe the answer to that is, eh, like, there was was a project I was on a little bit long, uh, not too long ago, and I ended up doing some long stuff in Twig, and I ended up regretting it later and wish I had pushed it in pre-process. But at that point, I, like I didn't want to do half one way and half the other way. I wanted to keep everything consistent, so I had to kind of push through it, and I didn't have time to refactor everything. So maybe maybe tend toward pre-process. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about how to set up the custom dot. Dot services. I saw you had another file theme dash de- development or dash dev dot services. Uh, what is that? How does that differ from? Uh... So I have like the two files right there. Let's go to that and let's look. Maybe there's another file in there I don't know about. Uh, let me get out of the theme. It's under sites. Oh yeah, yeah. theme development dot services. I have no clue what this oh. is. <laughs> okay. Did someone else put it there? <laughs> uh, I, I could probably look. It might have been another de- dev doing the exact same thing I did with the custom services. And like, the, you know, this is lullabot.com. So like we have, when it, whenever devs are available, we hop in and, and kind of help out, you know? So maybe someone didn't realize that I had mine in there and just kind of did that and committed it for whatever reason. But mine's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the first time I've seen the uh, the auto load and the cache um, settings in the in that services thing. That's that to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly what they do. I copied and pasted it from someone else. What is your ZS, ZSH theme? It looked really. Oh, nice. it's the, it's the default. It's just oh, okay. like the the it's it's just the what the oh my ZSH like so. If you're not familiar with Z shell, er, oh, darn it. Let's see, I'm trying to make this like nice and small right here.
OMIZSH is a terminal that you kind of does all this cool stuff for you out of the, out of like out of the box. And there's different themes like for this, but um, it's on GitHub and it works really well and you just install it and it does cool things. So this is iTerm and I use like multiple panels in iTerm. And, and so, so you can, you, you know, you can get branch and, and you, you hit tab and then it, it'll show you your different branches, you know, maybe get check out a, that's uh, not working. Oh, cause I'm not gonna, oh, let me do it up here. Get check out a, you can see like it'll, it'll automatically like show you the branches that are set up and I don't know, kind of things like that. Um, yeah, so that's basically the gist of it. Um, I know, like I said, that was that was pretty 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 short right there. So I could talk about something else too, um, or if there's any other questions or anything else. You did promise to pepper your presentation with stories from your childhood. All right. <laughs> I don't know if I want to indulge people in my childhood. Um, now that you're putting me on the spot. I'm what was the to... second? What was the second most voted on? I don't know. Let's see, see if I have that tab open. The CSS selectors. Yeah. All right. So CSS selectors right there. So I have that. Um, <laughs> so I gave this maybe about six months ago for my friend and meet up and I'm going to do it again. Does that show up for everybody? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So CSS selectors, I'm going to, that's me. I work at Lullabot. So we're going to talk about memes, what we're trying to solve, basic level selectors, combining selectors and chaining. So let me look at the screen really quick. And I want to see who here is like really familiar with CSS, like actually like knows their selectors and stuff pretty well. Got one, I got a couple, maybe some people behind there, uh, two. All right, cool. So maybe you learned something. I have some fun stuff in here, but if not, just indulge me and just like say like, hey. <laughs> So basic selectors, we're going to start with some basic stuff and then we're going to do combining. Then we're going to talk about pseudo elements, pseudo classes and some weird crap. And this is my, one of my favorite quotes right here. <laughs> CSS is easy. It's just a few thousand key value pairs that have quirks in each browser. That's pretty funny. And, and, and so, yeah, I started doing this thing and I thought it was going to be like pretty much straightforward. And then, it ended up being a hundred slides. And who's pinging me on Slack? So, Amy, June, and Mike, hold on, I'm gonna quit Slack. <laughs> That's an important conversation there, Herschel. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, so this ended up being like a whole lot of data right here. And then, oh yeah, it was actually 99 slides, so I like put this one in there. It was so close, right? So the first thing is like just some random stuff that I found on the internet. <laughs> yeah, so this one is funny right here. It was like remove a thousand lines of CSS. Site design doesn't change. Change one line of CSS. Everything breaks. And then, of course, everybody has probably seen the Peter Griffin CSS meme. I've felt like this before, and I know CSS fairly well. I've, I've struggled with uh, some things in the past. And, uh, you know, like, just tear it all out, restart. <laughs> all right, goodbye, everybody. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about what the problem is first. So this is HTML right here, right? And so, you know, you got to maybe, you got to, so this is, all right. 
I'm remembering this slide deck now. I haven't looked at the slide deck in like six months. So we have HTML and we have CSS, right? And without CSS, HTML will look something like this. It looks kind of ugly. But with CSS, it'll look really pretty. It'll look like this, right? And so when you're doing, like, when you're writing styles, there are certain styles that you want to, you want to target maybe a header, you want to target a button, and you want to target a div and list items, and maybe the, in this particular, and we want to, we want to target the, the hyperlink under the last list item and things like that. And so you have to do all these kind of crazy selectors and um, that's selectors are what allows you to choose what you're targeting. Right? So back here, we're actually, we want to target these particular things and then selectors are what enables us to do this. And what we're not talking about is we're not talking about declarations. De declarations are like what we're doing. We're changing the colors of something or layout. All we're talking about is selectors. We're talking about how to select the particular items. And a lot of these selectors, I'm, I'm talking about this maybe in the context of CSS, but you can also do it in JavaScript, right? So there's CSS selectors in JavaScript through the query selector and query selector all. And if you're doing jQuery, it's the same thing when you're doing like dollar parens and then you put the selector in there. So at this point, uh, I'm going to define a couple things. We have HTML markup. Um, HTML is just like the text that the website spits up initially. And then um, you have a DOM node. Your browser will parse and like start looking at all this text. And it starts putting everything together and like saying, all right, well, this is an element. You know, Elements and DOM nodes are the same exact thing. And it's, it's confusing because the word node and web uh, web development parlance can mean so many things. In Drupal world, it means like a piece of content. Uh, in JavaScript world, it's a JavaScript runtime environment. And then in, in browser world, it's an element. But in this particular case, we're calling it an element. And then you got CSS and style sheets are the same thing. Uh, a, a CSS style sheet is basically a piece of text that shows out your styles and your selectors in there. Uh, we have things like attributes. Attributes are like um, the thing, like little pieces of text that you add on to your elements. And uh, like class is an attribute. You might have some ARIA attributes and you might have an ID. So this is maybe like a standard, but, or, or a standard element that you see right here. We have IDs, we have classes, we have attributes. And keep in mind that the ID and the class are attributes. It's just that we can reference them special. There's attributes values in there. And so, yeah, so let, let's just talk about how to maybe start selecting crap, right? So the easiest thing to do is just what we call an element selector. And that's like, I want to select all my list items right here. And um, so in that particular case, it's going to select, like if you look at this HTML, there's a whole bunch of list uh, LI elements in there. And if you just type in LI, it's going to select them all. Um, you can select class menus. Class menus are have a period before that. You see a little period right there. And that says that this is a CSS class selector. And so that you can see that like down here, like these, um, this particular UL has more than one class. It's separated by space. But in this particular case, it, uh, like it will select uh, that that selector will select uh, anything. It doesn't matter what element that has a CSS class. It can it can have other ones, but it can it can, as long as it has that. ID selectors have that um, hashtag in front of it. The uh, the correct term for a hashtag is Octothorpe. I I, re, I learned that not too long ago, but you can also call it a pound sign or a hash or anything like that. Um, so basically it's the same thing as maybe like the period, but the ha the hash, uh, symbolizes that this is an ID selector. So in this particular case, like you can see our ID is primary nav, our science, and it will select that. Now ID selectors, there should be, IDs should be unique on your page. So it should only be selecting the one. 
Um, attribute selectors have the square brackets. You see like that square bracket right there. Um, it will look for any other, it will look for any attribute or any element that has an ARIA expanded attribute right here. So you can see this button right here has, has this ARIA expanded uh, equals false at the bottom. Be, right here, we just, we, we're seeing if it has ARIA expanded and it does. And you can also say, I only wanna select stuff if it's ARIA expanded equals true. So it's not gonna select this particular thing right here because that ARIA expanded is equals false. If you have ARIA, if that was true, it would, it would select it. Um, so you can get a little bit more complicated with that. You see like in this particular case right here, there's uh, that little carrot that's before the uh, equal sign within your selector. That's kind of cool because like if you might recognize that if you've been doing development, you know a little bit about regular expressions. So, like basically that means it's like this will, this will select any element that has an attribute, uh, has an href attribute that begins with HTTPS. Or in this particular case, it will select any, any element that has an href attribute that ends with PDF. And so this is kind of cool right here. You can use stuff like this to insert like icons if it ends with PDF or something like that, you know? Um, the, the, the asterisk icon will look for anywhere in there. If it has this dash text anywhere in that attribute, in the href attributes value, it'll match it, you know? So I can say like, you know, this is external or internal links or something like that. And you can do this all with CSS. You don't need a module, you don't need anything else, it's pretty neat. So you can use attribute selectors uh, in place of your ID selectors, right? So you can totally do things like class equals mega submenu, but don't do it because it's not normal and people have to read your code. You know, so like if you do something like this, it will totally work, but I highly recommend that you don't because you're just writing stuff that people are just going to have to spend extra mental energy to uh, decipher. Uh, you have things like a universal selector right here, selects everything. So universal selector will just select everything on the page. And it's very common to see this box sizing border box, which basically resets the, uh, the, the box size, like, well, you can understand is it selects the box or resets the box model. And that's a very common thing. So those are like some basic selectors right there, but we typically end up combining those selectors. You'll see stuff like this in your CSS right here. So you'll see like um, a descendant selector that's separated by spaces right here. So you can see there's three selectors right here. You know, we have an ID that has a hash. Then we have a class that has a period. And then we have one that has neither, and that's just an element right here. So in this particular case, we're looking for any type of A, A elements, which are hyperlinks, that are nested under any type of elements that have a mega submenu CSS class, which in turn are nested under any elements that have an ID of primary dash nav dash r dash science. So you can see the primary nav, our science ID right there. You can see the mega sub menu. That means it's gonna select all these A, uh, all, all these hyperlinks under there. And at that point you would, you would um, apply your rule sets and you could change the colors. You could apply margins, paddings, all that crap. So you have a direct child selector right here. So a direct child is, is this like little, you know, what is it? Greater, yeah, greater than, right? That's a greater than symbol. So um, this basically says the li element needs to be directly under the flex. If there's an intermediately an intermediate uh, element in there, it's not going to match. So you can see the li. Um, we're look, it's looking for all the L, well, let's see what we're doing right here. It's looking for all the LIs that are under the uh, flex. So all these LIs down here, they're not directly under the flex. They're under this, you know, UL and stuff like that. So those aren't going to match. Um, the general sibling selector. This is a tilde. This is one that's like 
Not, not too common, but if you use it, you can do some interesting things. So this will select um, all elements that are siblings after the, the, uh, the previous selector right here. So in this particular case, it's going to select all LI elements that appear in the DOM after any element that has a my-class CSS class. So in this particular case, you can see that this li right here has a my class, so this is gonna select these down here. You have an adjacent sibling selector, which is very similar to the sibling selector, but only the first of those. So in this particular case, it's gonna do that one, you know, the, the next element that's after the my class. Now this is useful a lot of times for focus states. You can do things like if my class has focus, then you know apply something to that. Uh, who's calling me? Man, all these people calling me. Chaining selectors. Um, so you could, you could, when I say chaining selectors, I'm talking about like instead of doing like descendants, you're actually like putting them together. So. In this particular case, we have a singles uh, selector, ul period flex, ul dot flex. And what this, because there's no space in there, this is, what this is gonna do is this is gonna look for any ul elements that have a flex CSS class. You can see that's right there. Chaining selectors. So um, in this particular case, we're looking for uh, any button elements that have a CSS class of btn-s primary that also have an attribute of type that is equal to submit. So you can kind of see, and in this particular case, uh, it's very similar to that, but we're adding on an additional class. So there's like a button, any button element that has a form item, a form-item CSS class that also has a btn-s primary CSS class that also has a type of submit, uh, a type attribute set to submit. And you can just, you can add these on forever. For example, in this particular case, it's all the same, but ex with the addition that it also, if for this to match, needs to have an ARIA expanded attribute set to false. You can combine all these selectors with commas. So there is, uh, there's a particular use case where you might have like a very complicated set of rules and you want to combine that to a bunch of different uh, types of selectors. You just combine those with commas. You can see the commas, commas right there. Uh, so you put, you know, one selector chain, comma, next selector chain, comma, and it kind of works. Pseudo elements. So um, you can see in this particular case right here, there are, you can see like right here, there's a before pseudo element and after pseudo elements. You can see these in dev tools. And you can also see I have my, I, I put this screenshot right here because I use uh, emojis for my hamburger icon CSS class, which is 100% valid. So you can use emojis in your CSS class, by the way, uh, or anything else. It's pretty cool. So anyway, so you can see there's this before and after pseudo, uh, pseudo elements right down here. And these are like almost like elements that appear like default elements that, that you don't have to type into your markup that, that appear within your other elements. But you have to kind of, uh, it's a little more complicated than that because you have to like create a content property in order for them to actually appear. So they, yeah, so they ena enable you to insert DOM nodes at the beginning and ending of elements. And you can see like some people type in colon before, some people type in colon colon before. The colon colon before I think is more semantically correct, but every I've always done the colon before. It's, it works cross browser, it's less to think about, and it saves you vital microseconds. So um, you just chain those together right there. So like I can, I can type in button colon after and say content and put in a little arrow and it will do that afterwards and it's pretty cool. Um, there's a before, you can put it before. Um, before and after pseudo elements are fairly common. They're supported ever since Internet Explorer 9 and um, there's a lot of, you can insert decorative text, insert an image. Uh, all right, so this is, 
yeah, what am I doing right here? Oh, yeah, I guess. Uh, so, like, this is the player on Lullabot.com, the um, audio player that we talked about or that I showed earlier. And you can see that the play icon is a before pseudo element. The pause icon is, is the same pseudo element. And uh, so you can make shapes out of these pseudo elements, which is kind of cool. Um, there's other useful things, including first letter. Like, you ever see, like, where you're on like a fancy like news website, like maybe like Financial Times or something, and like you're looking at an article, and that first letter is bigger than the rest. You can target that through CSS through the first dash letter selector. There's a first dash line selector. Uh, there's placeholder selector that um, is an input text element. There's a selection selector. When you select your text, you can create different colors for that. Uh, just Google it and you'll end up on MDN's webpage and you can find that other cool crap. So states, so there's things like hover states. Hover states are where you put push your mouse over something so you can, uh, so the hover states is, is very much like a pseudo element where you put a colon and then you put the, whatever the state is. So in this particular case, we want like on my particular button, Whenever I move that mouse over there, I want the background color to turn red. It will do that. And you can do the same for focus states, which are very important for accessibility. And there's a focus within state that is super awesome. The focus within state says, is there anything in the descendant DOM tree that has focus? And if so, I can do stuff to this uh, element. Now this is super useful. I can I can actually show you some stuff that I've been working on. I haven't even pushed this yet on Olivero. Um, let me show this to you. See if I can do this. Uh, dev dot. Let me zoom out. So all right. So I've I've been trying to make this work uh, pretty good with not without JavaScript. So I disabled JavaScript through this like little Chrome extension right here. And what I have right here, you can see when I'm tabbing over, like I'm using my keyboard or my keyboard to tab over, and I I I do I focus that right there. I'm actually I actually uh, toggle some CSS, and you can see I'm using uh, focus within on um, on this right here. There's a focus within, I set that focus within class and it toggles it. And so if anything within this element right here has focus, it'll open that up. Anyway, let's get back. So I shown, I made use of that. Um, let's get back into where I was going here. And he's calling me again. All right, so focus within input. <laughs> so my daughter's talking in the other room. Uh, so uh, you can say like if a checkbox is checked, like for example, I, I want to do something, but only if the checkbox is checked, you know? So in this particular case, anything that's checked, I want to give this checkbox a, uh, a border, you know, a red border right there. Um, there's other things, active, disabled, uh, uh, visited, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, once again, that suit uh, on MDN. I'm gonna tell my daughter to go into another room. Hold on one second, so I can concentrate. Daughter is scrammed. So now let's talk about pseudo classes. So now we have like things like not. This is like some cool stuff right here. So I love not. I use it a lot. It's supported in everything, you know, ever since Internet Explorer 9. And so basically it's, it's just like negates uh, whatever's in there. So in this particular case, like right here, this is going to select any element that has the cards dash dash border dash blue that doesn't have the class of is active. And that's pretty cool. Like you can do uh, things like uh, I don't want to, I want to select everything but the last child and I'll show you last children in a bit. First child, last child right here. 
So you can you can select the last child of something, you know. So if the list item in this particular case is the last child, I'm going to select a element under there. So let's look at this once again. So I'm, I'm I'm looking for any any a elements that are under a list item a li element that is also a last child that is under the mega sub menu somewhere under the mega sub menu. So this is only going to this is only going to select the a the the hyperlink under the last list child and i use stuff like this all the time to kind of remove bottom margins from the last thing or remove top margins from the first thing and things like that that's that's a pretty common use case and my dog is here because it's thundering outside she's trying to hide under me um so you can do nth child, you know, so there's th like nth child, even an odd. You, so this is really easy right here. Um, it basi basically, you could do like, you can create your zebra stripes without any extra CSS classes by just saying any, any nth child, any even uh, TR element will have a background a level of light gray right here. And... Um, you can say, I only want a particular class, uh, a, a particular, uh, uh, like, like, I only want the second one to be selected. So in this particular case, it's going to select only the second list child. So it's nth child and then in parentheses two. So it's only going to select the second one. But you can do the N right there. So this is getting more complicated right here. So in this particular case, we want the nth child, but four n. So this is going to select every fourth child. So not just the fourth, not just the fourth child, but every fourth child. So it'll select the fourth, the eighth, the twelfth, etc. But what if you want to select instead of the fourth, the eighth, and the twelfth, you want to select maybe like the ninth. I mean the fifth, the ninth, and the thirteenth. Well, you can do things like this. It's four n plus one right here and this is pretty common too this gets uh kind of confusing whenever you're doing it in practice and i always go into dev tools mess with it and like you know you have some css in there so it's background red to make sure you're selecting the appropriate thing that's complicated stuff only child so uh, this will select an element if it is uh, the only child under its parent. So this list item, this li element, is the only li element there. This selector will resolve. You need, then you can do all this from the in, instead of going from the beginning, you can go from the end. So instead of like nth child, you can do nth lat and the last child, and this will select every fourth element plus one, but counting from the end. And this, which is pretty cool. So like you can do nth last child two and it will select a second from the end or nth last child five and it'll select a fifth from the end. So you can get like super, super granular with your selectors. And like, it's pretty cool, right? Uh, you can do nth of type. So going in down the rabbit hole here and this is all supported across all your browsers. You can do, if this is, this will select the nth of type um, from the beginning, but only the list items because it's the list items nth of type. So it will select any type of list, any only list items that are uh, that that like match the four n plus one. And 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 if you think about this, yes, there is an nth last of type. And there's only of type, yeah, last of type. So you can see like all this stuff, this rabbit hole goes pretty deep. It's all cool. Empty, empty is pretty cool, except that it sucks. So uh, this will select any list item that is empty, except if there's a space in there, like if there's any white space or an HTML comment, it won't resolve. It's kind of basically useless. So cool recipes right here. There's a bunch of cool stuff. So that there was like a whole bunch of stuff that I talked about right there, but you can, you can apply the stuff right here. So like in this particular case right here, what I'm doing is I can say, all right, I'm going to select all the hyperlinks that begin with mail two, 
that you know if they have an email address. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert an envelope after it. So that will tell me just through CSS, or that will tell the user, what it'll do is it'll just make an email address that has, uh, when the email address, when the hyperlink displays, it'll insert a little envelope after that. Like that's super cool. Same thing with the PDF. If if your link ends with a dot with a with the with the letters PDF, it will then uh, insert uh, an empty like like a little box right here that has a background image, and the background image points to, uh, is a PDF icon, and so you can basically through CSS only, you can insert icons for all your PDFs. Um, quantity selectors are super cool. So let's say I want to select everything, but only if it has exactly four children, you know, and I might want to do this because I'm going to set the width to 25% or change the colors or whatever right there. So what I, what I'm doing right here, I'm, 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 I'm saying if the first child is also the nth last child of four, I want to select that. And then I just want to select any type of siblings after that. And then what that will do is that will match all the selectors, but only if there's exactly four um, uh, children under there. Like if it has exactly four, like if it has three other siblings, then it will match. And then you can do the same thing. So like, like, like let's say I, 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 want, I want it to only match if, there's on, if, the, if the first child is also nth last of child 4n. So basically, if the count of children that are like under this div is a multiple of four, it'll match. So you can do cool things like this to, to do like, say like, if, every, if it's a multiple of four, I want it to be width of 25%. If it's multiple of three, I want it to be, with the 33.3%, 3 you know, if it's with the something else, I want to be, you know, or if, if it's a, if it's a, um, what do you call it? Like, a, it, if it's a multiple of something else, I want it to be, you know, with of something else. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can, you can do a uh, little toggle menus uh, with checkboxes. So you can, you can say like, I have my menu container that contains all my menus and it's styled really nice and I'm gonna display none of that. But there's a little check box that might be styled like a hamburger icon or something like that right beforehand. And if that gets checked, then my menu, uh, my menu container gets shown. Like that's pretty neat. We actually do that on lullabot.com. Like our, uh, our little hamburger menu for mobile is CSS only, see that right there. And ta-da, I guess that's it. I feel like I've looked at this slide. This is the first time I looked at this slide deck in like six months. So hopefully it wasn't too bad. Any questions? Yes, I have one for you. Go ahead. Have they figured out a way to select a parent of an item? Hell no. <laughs> no, you have to use JavaScript. It's, it's yeah. cascading, it's cascading style sheets that flows down. You be quiet. I don't know why they can't do that. You know? Yeah, that's not happening. Well, like, you know, the rule of some child, you know what it is, and you want to be able to do something to its parent. It's really annoying. Yeah, that does not exist. You know, usually, you like, you do this talk, right? Before. What's that? I said you gave this talk before. Is it posted somewhere? I don't know if it has. If not, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and this is being recorded too. Um, I I gave this talk at my front end meetup, and I don't know if I actually posted it oh. anywhere. But if not, Amy June's uh, recording it. Yep, I'll have it up tomorrow on the San Francisco Triple Users Group. Hey, Amy June. Did anybody learn anything? No. I learned how much I don't know. I know, right? It's scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can learn so much. And I've used some of these things. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what that's for. Like the whole, <laughs> actually, the thing that I like the most about this is the, the fact that the attribute selector could be used for class and ID. Basically, those are wrappers on that. I think that's 
a good way to look at that, honestly. But, and and I didn't even go into specificity too. Um, you can and you can increase like spe like like certain things have more specificity than others. And you can actually chain like the same CSS class together to include to increase specificity too, or chain like like I can do like you know you know if if I have one uh, one element that like has a class of my dash class I can put I can have a selector that says dot my dash class dot my dash class dot my dash class and it'll all resolve because you don't need that class in there multiple times and but it'll have more more specificity there's lots of ways to like hack things at that and i've done some stuff anything, like that don't use important what's that we've learned anything just don't use important yeah yeah and then there's important but this is all about selectors not necessarily the rule sets and sometimes important is useful but people use it as a crutch Any other questions for Mike? Oh, I'm still waiting great. for some stories from childhood. Um, so I grew up on a pig farm in northeastern Pennsylvania. It was about 60 acres. I, uh, I, I, w I wasn't there like my whole childhood, but I was there for a bunch of it. We got to like run, like it was funny, like it was like full on like 1980s. Like we would like literally go and play in junkyards with like old refrigerators and copperheads and crap like that, you know, and uh, just run off and then make it back in the, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, what else did we do? I, I don't know. Funny stories. Uh, we go trick or treating. That was fun. Anyway, I can't even think of anything super funny right now. Anything worthy of a story. I'm sure I have some somewhere. Can you share the slides for the selector? I will. I will do that. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.